John Gardner is one of the most difficult to define of modern American writers and also one of the most talented. On the one hand, he's proved his versatility with poetry, novels, stories, children's books. On the other, he's reluctant to do anything that seems like journalism. He's proved to be enormously popular. October Light is a bestseller. But he won't do anything to enhance his popularity. This is one of the few interviews he's agreed to. He considers himself a product of our times, but much of his inspiration comes from the Middle Ages. To me, the first question had to be whether or not medieval literature is really applicable to our present situation. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think one thinks about those things. You know, you... You, you just well, fall into it? You fall into... Yeah, right. You, you teach or, or read what you like, and I've always liked classical and medieval literature better than anything else. I think it was sort of sort of ended with Shakespeare, and I don't really like Shakespeare that much. I, you know, I like Shakespeare, all right. But uh, but the kinds of things that I really love are, are the best of the medieval things, like Dante, like Beowulf, and, and so on. Uh, I like some things which are carryovers from that time, like fairy tales and folk songs and so on. But uh, I think the sort of rise of uh, middle-class literature was a bad thing. That is to say, it's all very well for the middle class, and it's all very well for you know young girls learning to read. That they're you know books like Clarissa, but they're really a drag, and they haven't gotten better. There are always a few things. I was talking a little while ago about Tom Jones. That's an older kind of work, you know. But I mean, it's a Fielding looks at this middle class thing that's rising, and he's disgusted by it, and he says, "This is how you should do it," you know. And he did a beautiful job, but nobody picked up on it. People kept doing those middle class novels. A few very clever guys play games with it like uh, Defoe is interesting because he doesn't really like that stuff either you know and so he makes big enormous sort of ugly jokes about it for instance Robinson Crusoe he takes all the materials of the adventure story you know an island and, and strange savages and you know strange weather and everything is set up so that you'll get a thriller right and he writes I think quite intentionally he was a you know parodist and satirist all his life and, and besides spy, etc., and I'm sure and he did it on purpose. He writes this boring, boring stuff about this boring middle-class fool who goes to this thrilling island and builds a house and puts a fence around it and lives like a middle-class Londoner. There's so much in what you said. First of all, are you seriously suggesting that the, the literature of the aristocracy is the right kind of literature? Yeah, sure, sure. And I think that, that as a matter of fact, that, I don't think that's snobism. I think that uh, every kid in a democracy would like that literature better if you knew it. But of course the thing that happens in a democracy is that the teachers lose touch with what's good. They don't know, you know? Like how many art teachers in ordinary public schools have been to an art museum? You know, just that. How many writing, teachers of creative writing in high schools and colleges for that matter really know what the Iliad is about? You know, like I've, I've, uh, I've talked with an awful lot of professors. I, I think there are a handful of people in America who understand the poem Beowulf. And I don't think there's even a handful in England. You know, it, it's just lost knowledge. Well, what I, I don't know anybody who knows about Dante. I don't know a single person who understands what Dante's doing. That doesn't, I don't mean that as arrogance. It's just a fact. People read little sections of it. They talk about the Dolce Stil Nuova. That's all. Why? Right? I think one could make a case mm -hmm. that uh, uh, things that happened five, six, seven hundred years ago uh, are not really relevant to the way we live now, that those mm. people didn't live with machinery, they didn't live in the age of anxiety, uh, they didn't live with the kind of, uh, of tensions, with the kind of communications that we have today. I, I think that's probably not true. I think, in fact, that uh, pick your age. Pick the age, for instance, of uh, Alexandrian Greece with Apollonius Rhodius writing in an overpopulated, uh, effete, um, decadent society. He writes a book which is, uh, which is a, a bitter, kind of ironic, very Donald Bartholomew-like book in imitation of the epic form, but actually making fun of the epic form and, and expressing, you know, his, his, his ultra-modern kind of disgust and despair and all this kind of business. Now, what period are you talking about now? Well, that's, mm, I don't know about dates, 3rd century uh, B.C., uh, one can find at the end of every great period decadent literature very much like ours. The difference is that we have for the first time, and it's a great thing, real democracy in which everybody 
can be educated. And as everybody begins to be educated and everybody begins to say what education ought to be, then education changes. And so that the kind of values which make first-rate philosophy or art or anything else disappear or become rare, at least. There are obviously lots of writers in America who, who are still concerned about great art and are trying to, to, to create it. But mostly, that's not true. Looking through hundreds of, of, of manuscripts the last few months, in connection with you know some prize being awarded, I found about 20 manuscripts that that showed a real concern with art. Almost all of them are trash of one kind or another. Formula stories, you know, like the mystery thriller, mostly porno and sometimes high class porno, which is what mostly you read these days. You're talking about genre writing, and yes, you are a great yeah. devotee of genre writing. Different genres. Yeah, different genres, genres, but still, you're, yeah. you, you hark back to the fairy tale and to the moral tale and so on. Mm -hmm. You're very interested in uh, uh, copying or lifting yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. elements from other people, the, just, the way, just the way uh, uh, Chaucer and Dante were. That's true. But the point, of course, really is that those old genres are intellectual genres. They have the elements they have in them because they help you think, you know, just like a mathematical system helps you think. And... That's not true of modern genres. Modern genres are basically created so that a person can um, divulge himself, whine, talk about his love life, talk about you know anything he wants to. No serious questions come up in the modern novel. You know how to raise your kids is not a subject we talk about. Uh, don't you do it say very that well. about uh, Philip Roth and Saul Bellow? Oh yeah, sure. Well, shouldn't I? Well, I don't know. It, 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 it takes me by Bella, surprise. What does Saul Bella tell you about how to raise your kids? No, wait a second. I, I can't, I, at first I thought you were against talking about how to raise your kids. No, now, no, Now you're no. saying you're in favor. I, I'm in favor of it. No, I think, I think literature should think. I think literature should work out problems. For instance, uh, Nietzsche figures out this idea of the Superman. Right? He's not the first, but he's the most famous. Dostoevsky thinks about it, too. Nietzsche makes up an abstract system. And, and all his statements in his syllogism are abstract statements, and he comes out with a false answer. That is, it is possible to be a Superman. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, is very much concerned about the same question. He puts a made-up Superman in a real St. Petersburg with a real family and so on, and he asks, is it possible to be a Superman? He asks it just as objectively, in fact, as Nietzsche asks it. But because he's got to deal with an actual laboratory experiment, you know, he knows some days it rains, he knows that... Sometimes you kill an old lady and, and her sister's going to be there and you have to kill her too and so on. Because Dostoevsky is thinking in concrete sort of laboratory terms, he comes up with a stable and valid answer. This is what, it seems to me, always happens in great art. Great art works on, on questions. And it works very sparely, very neatly, without lots of garbage thrown in. Uh, this is not what I think modern literature generally does. I think modern literature generally assumes that I give a damn about the writer's trip to Bermuda. Look at the New Yorker, story after story after story, sensitive little recordings of a time we went ice skating in Wales. You know, it's all crap. It's nothing. I mean, it's gossip. You're right? talking about the New Yorker. Even the people at the New Yorker will agree that the emphasis in that magazine has shifted away from fiction, the idea sure. being somehow that fiction no longer serves the needs of our society, of our generation, and I, that journalism does. Yeah, that's a very trendy notion. Right. I think it's not true. I think journalism just tells you more gossip. And, of course, if fiction is telling gossip and journalism is telling gossip, the best gossip to listen to is journalism. You know, it's more likely to be true. And it's not as embarrassing. You know, that you're not being you're, asked to be intimate. You're one of the few really well-known writers nowadays who, as far as I know, isn't doing journalism or hasn't tried journalism over an extended period. Mm, that's true. I haven't done much journalism once in a while, a little bit. Let me shift gears here. Right. You're, uh, you're also a writer who has written uh, some children's books, mm -hmm. or you've written for children. I would like to ask, what is uh, children's literature? What does it mean? Yeah, I think children's literature is, is just good literature, which is available to children. Um, I, I think when somebody decides to write for children, the likelihood is you're going to write down and write goofy, and it's going to be bad. But some books are books which any child can easily read and understand. It has to do with size of vocabulary. It has to do with concepts which are familiar to the child or which the child is, is about ready to become familiar with and so on. But uh, I wouldn't write a children's book by different artistic principles than I would write an adult book by. 
but obviously uh, a lot of adult literature is simply not understandable to children. That's true. Yeah, right. So how do you deal with that? Well, I'm. <laughs> what, what, why would I want to deal with it? Well, if, as you say, uh, children's literature is simply good literature. Right, right. It's, it's good literature which is available to a child. Available to his understanding. Yeah, right, and to his imagination, to his experience. In England, my novel, Grendel, was, was published as a children's novel. Here, it was treated as an adult novel. Can I think you explain that? Right. How, how was Grendel treated as an adult novel? You mean it was... Well, it was published as a, you know, an adult novel and, and advertised, reviewed in the, in the grown-up pages of the New York Times and so on, whereas in England, it was reviewed with children's books. Yeah. Is it fair to say, I, as far as I can tell it is, uh, that one element about your fairy tales that is uh, different from the mm. traditional fairy tales uh, is that your characters seem to have more self-doubt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. No, that's, that's... And that comes from our age of anxiety, I guess. Yeah, right. It's, uh, it's something that, that we have admitted now that people in the past didn't admit. You know, for centuries, people mm. pretended to, uh, to be grown-ups, you know, and, and told children when you were grown-up, etc. And... Uh, there have always been writers who knew that wasn't true. Chaucer was one, for example. Chaucer, uh, again and again, treats adult situations as uncertainty situations. In fact, the whole Canterbury Tales, well, he, he came out of the nominalist tradition in philosophy, which says things like, you know, you can't understand me, you know, there's no way I can express my ideas, and so on. He didn't believe all that, but nevertheless, it was all around. In fact, nominalism in between the 12th and 14th centuries, but particularly in the 14th century, was practically identical to positivism, which everybody now espouses except it was more intelligently written, and in Latin. But, um, you know, I'm, but I'm thinking as, you, as you're hitting us with all this erudition and all this mm. reading that you've done, that I think people would be surprised to find out how, how very simple and clear your writing is. That's true. My writing is simple and clear. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it is partly because I'm not interested in, in purveying gossip. I'm interested in, in laying down a story step by step so that the ideas are worked out, so that when I get through with the story, I've figured out what I think. And... Every time I work out a story... More than I the... Ca obvious, well, obviously, right. the writer knows more than the characters in the story. But I was thinking, uh, in the Dragon, Dragon, the tailor wonders whether his fate is just. Mm -hmm. In that story of yours, uh, the miller's mule, right. the miller never really knows uh, right. who his enemies are. Right. That's true. Yeah. Could your stuff only be written in the mid-1970s, the stuff oh, yeah. that you're putting out now? Or would it have been possible for you to have lived in a different age and written similar things? No, I, I, it wouldn't be possible, I think. You are uh, a proper reflection of your time. Oh, yeah, sure, I think so. But I think that the really important thing for, for every artist to be is simultaneously a proper reflection of his time and a carrier on of, of the great old traditions. And if he doesn't know his roots, he doesn't know what to judge himself against. That's why you write a myth, like when I did Jason Medea, one of the rules, it's always been one of the classical rules, is you have to go through every single event in the classical story. You know, like if Medea says at some point some famous line that Euripides quotes and Apollonius quotes and so on, you've got to make her say that line, and you've got to understand in modern terms how could she say such a thing. And the check, the test, when you're working with traditional forms, as I do, is can I still understand what people did, you know, in Homer's day? And that's why literature doesn't end up being merely gossipy because it's an attempt to understand not just your own age but the nature of mankind and uh, mankind hasn't changed although it's got different machines and different cultures and so on can i ask you about something that bothers me sure uh, i'm i'm a little bit confused and disoriented by some of the things you're writing i'm mm -hmm. thinking of the miller's mule mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is about um, a miller we don't have millers nowadays i presume it's a sort of homage to chaucer uh, it obviously takes place in a society that's very different from ours, and yet there's a ketchup bottle, mm -hmm. there's a gun in it. You mm -hmm. use the word traipsing around, very right. modern idiom. Uh, how, how is the reader to, uh, to orient himself or to, or to think of the situation when you're mixing the cultures? Right. I, I don't mean to be mixing cultures. I mean to be creating a completely integral, integral uh, world. You know, which, which you imagine and you see and you accept everything. I just finished a, a, a novel-length fairy tale in which there's a, a prince who rides around on a horse and he really doesn't like horses, he prefers trains. And if, if the world I've created is convincing enough, then the reader just accepts that in this particular curious world there are knights in armor and railroad trains. Uh, there, are, there are ladies uh, and there also are feminists, in, you know, 
everything modern can be put into any kind of dress. Shakespeare did this all the time. You know, like uh, the Italians he writes about in his romantic Italian plays didn't dress like he says, but, you know, never mind. Who cares? When you look at paintings, you know, in, in museums of, of classical subjects, it's sort of marvelous. You look at, you know, an 11th century picture, a 14th century picture, 15th, 16th, 18th. They're always reflections of their own time. So it's, it's no problem. In fact, if, if a 19th century painter was really smart, I don't know of anybody who caught it, he should have had a picture of Hero and Leander with a train in the distance. They, they certainly got, you know, Victorian clothes, so they, they should have the train. Okay, thank you very much. I, do you have any of this stuff, the uh, moral tales about animals? Do you have any of it with you? I don't have any with me. I don't think I know any either. Surely you know the one about the, the bear. The bear, I know, yes, right. Uh, if someone offers you a bear, bow low and say no. And so, with a wink of his eye, John Gardner takes his leave, inviting us, in my opinion at least, to regard many of his opinions about modern literature as if they were bears.